Good afternoon and welcome. Today's program is Diagnostic Complexity, Treating Eating Disorders and Comorbid Substance Abuse. I'm Julie Miller, Editor-in-Chief of Addiction Professional. Today's program is a Foundation's Recovery Network webinar sponsored by Millennium Health. Thank you to our sponsor and thanks to everyone in our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Glad you could join us. Before we get started, we do have a few details to review with you. You'll notice that each window on your screen can be moved by clicking and dragging or enlarged and minimized by clicking on the icons in the top right corner of each window. Please use the Q&A area to the right of the slides to submit a question at any time. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. But if you can't see this area, simply click on the red Q&A button. To download a copy of today's presentation, please click on the link in the resources area in the lower left of your screen. If you have any technical issues at all during the program, just click on the yellow help button and we can definitely help you troubleshoot the issue. A special note about CE credit. To receive credit for today's program, you must click on the green CE certificate button at the conclusion of this program and complete the evaluation form. If you're watching today's program in a group, please download the group submission guide and the program evaluation form, which is located in today's resources list, and follow the instructions. If you have any issues with this process, we ask that you do not reach out to today's sponsor as they will not be able to offer assistance in receiving a certificate. Please note that CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for the live event today. And finally, you can also tweet during today's webinar by clicking on the blue Twitter icon at the bottom of your screen. Simply click Post and Authorize buttons to log into your Twitter account and begin sharing automatically at the event hashtag APLiveWebinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the program today, Melanie Smith. Melanie is the Program and Training Manager at the Renfrew Center of Florida, where she oversees the Clinical Group Therapy Programming. She's also a member of the Corporate Clinical Training Department that is responsible for developing and implementing clinical programming across the Renfrew system, which has 16 locations nationwide and leverages emerging research and evidence-based practices. Melanie, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today, and with that, I will turn the audience over to you. Well, thank you, Julie, so much, and thank you again, everyone, for really taking the time out of your day to, um, and, a, and a very important time, because I think it's probably lunchtime for most of you, and I know for me and for us at the Renfrew Center, lunchtime is essential and important. Um, so for taking the time out to hear what we have to say and to um, certainly become um, more educated and informed about um, about eating disorders and certainly about um, behavioral health and emotional disorders as a whole, um, as I think we can all learn well um, from one another. Um, what I'd like to do to start us off actually is um, have everyone kind of participate in a poll question. Um, so what you'll see on your screen is a question, and I'd like you to think about how much you agree or disagree with the statement that's listed. Um, so I want you to think about um, the statement. I believe that each individual disorder should be treated separately with treatment interventions that are specific to that disorder. Um, so if you can go ahead at right now um, on your screen and click whether you agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, or disagree, um, that would be very helpful. And I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Um, and this information will be useful for me as a presenter in thinking about um, the areas that we want to focus on moving forward. So again, um, how much do you agree with the statement? I believe that each individual disorder should be treated separately with treatment interventions that are specific to that particular disorder. Okay. And I can tell you that my answer to this question might have been different say, a year or two ago, maybe two years ago, than it is now. So I'm interested to see what others are, are experiencing. So, okay, so this is a great um, little piece of technology here that gives us <laughs> some information live. So it looks like we're kind of spread pretty evenly. I don't know if that's what I expected. So it seems like across the board, there's certainly some variability as far as what it is um, 
we think would be the best or most effective way to treat disorders. And that's really part of the question that we're asking today is we're looking at diagnostic complexity and we're looking at um, trying to really take a take an examination of our patient population. And we really looking at the reality that our patient population is quite diverse and quite complex. And that when uh, each individual patient is so complex, it leaves us as clinicians really challenged with and making good clinical treatment decisions. Decisions, and that's not always an easy thing to do. Um, so I want to spend quite a bit of time talking about that and really orienting the presentation into two different parts. The first part really looking at kind of the context of the problem and the many different layers of the problem of the complex patient, um, the comorbid patient, the patient that has a lot going on when they walk into your door that makes you take the step back and say, Oh my goodness! What do I gonna, what do I do? Um, and then, um, hopefully, what what we would then do is the second half of the time, I will be offering up a solution that I, I'm hoping that you will find to be something that you might consider thinking more about, researching more, and incorporating more in the way that you practice. So um, just in a little bit about the background of myself and, and the Renfrew Center is that we are um, a women's uh, treatment center for exclusively for the treatment of eating disorders. Renfrew was actually the first treat residential treatment center that ever existed that was exclusively for eating disorders. So when we opened um, 30 years ago in 1985 back in Philadelphia, there really was not a field. There was no, no eating disorder field. Primarily anyone with an eating disorder or a been identified with an eating disorder was treated, if they were treated at all, they were treated probably in like an inpatient psychiatric unit inside of a medical hospital. They may have been tube fed or force fed um, and had other kind of psychiatric or behavioral interventions, but not really um, any sort of uh, psychotherapy or, or any other treatment. Um, and Renfrew really was at the beginning of that. So that's something we're incredibly proud of, and it certainly informs everything that we're doing moving forward. Um, and that our model really started as a model of, of relationships, um, really thought, um, formed around relational cultural theory that was coming out of the Stone Center, a part of Wellesley College, and um, really looking that um, our therapeutic approach has been for, for 30 years and continues to be that healing happens in the context of relationships and interpersonal relationships. And um, while we, this is absolutely still the foundation of what we do, we do also recognize that um, moving and looking forward into the future, we do also need to, um, it behooves us to pay attention to what the science is saying. It behooves us to pay attention to what all the data that's been collected over now the 30 plus years that this field has existed, because again, back in the day, there was no data at all to inform us. So um, it would really be remiss of us to not pay attention to what the data is saying. But for most clinicians like myself, um, it's very difficult to kind of translate what it says in a journal article um, within what it is that I do in practice. So we're going to look at that today, but that as a, as a center and as a field, we really are looking to be much more integrative of what um, evidence-based findings are and really have our practice reflect that. So that's another area of what we're going to be looking at today. Um, so in talking about that problem, I said that really this, this presentation is broken up into two parts. We're looking at a problem that has many, many layers and then identifying a possible solution and I think a pretty good solution. And one particular problem of note is that um, the clients that we treat, the patients that walk through our door, are different now than they were 30 years ago. Um, there's there's a great um, wide range of diversity of what we see in our patient population, and that really the the stereotype um, that eating disorders only affect women who are um, white, um, adolescent from affluent families is just not correct. Um, that stereotype very much continues to be pervasive kind of in the in the general kind of understanding or, uh, of culture, but that's not actually true. Um, we do now have data to back up that that's not true, and certainly in our 30 years of treatment experience here at Renfrew, we can definitely say that we've seen um, we've seen that there's much more diversity in that. So as far as age group, we're seeing um, women present to treatment or girls really present to treatment at very young ages. Um, there there are many many studies of of young young children in, in different parts of the world, mostly Western societies, but in different parts of the world where they're um, very early, school age, if not younger, presenting with um, behaviors in which they're looking to restrict their caloric intake or um, exercise excessively and being very focused on weight and shape. 
um, and things that, you know, it makes me sad to think about young girls um, feeling this way, thinking this way, and behaving this way, but that we're seeing that um, with increasing incidence, which is very alarming. We're also seeing women come into treatment much later in life. Um, it was once believed, and we've now shown this to be not true, but it was once believed that eating disorders developed during adolescence around puberty and that if you kind of had made it past that point in your life without an eating disorder that you were in the clear. You wouldn't develop one later in life and that's not necessarily the case. Um, we're seeing women admit to treatment in their 60s and 70s for the first time, never having had treatment before, some of which are people who had just been struggling for a very long time and had not received treatment, and others who had developed um, an eating disorder later in life due to other life stressors that may have um, uh, influenced that. Um, we're seeing diversity in ethnicity, and again, this is not just the white girl's problem. So um, we're seeing women of color. Um, now, what I would tell you is that in our particular environment, we do still see a majority of Caucasian women, but we don't believe this is because only Caucasian women struggle. I think there's a lot of barriers to care um, that really end up being kind of the primary ex reason or explanation as to why we're not seeing as much diversity in treatment as we believe is actually out there in the population. Um, because these stereotypes are held so strongly, I think sometimes clinicians and medical professionals aren't always asking the right question when a woman of color um, comes into the office and is presenting with a lot of concerns that to me are very stereotypical eating disorder, but um, they may not be um, noticed, I guess, um, on, a, on someone who is not the typical um, person you would expect to have an eating disorder. We're certainly seeing variation, again, in socioeconomic status, but again, this is not just for the affluent, um, because eating disorders are not actually a disease of vanity, although um, popular culture may lead you to believe it to be. Um, that's not at all how we conceptualize eating disorders, and I'll get into how we do conceptualize them a little bit later. Um, as far as LGBTQ, um, the transgender population, and really what this should say is gender, slash LGBTQ is that, first of all, I've been talking about women a lot, and I acknowledge that this is my bias because my um, treatment center only treats women. However, um, men absolutely experience eating disorders too. Now, the um, presence in the, the incidence in the general population is certainly greater in women than in men of eating disorders. However, men absolutely do experience the entire range of eating disorders. And we are seeing, again, increasing numbers of people seeking treatment um, that are transgendered um, as well. And then also size diversity is something important to note that people don't always think about. Um, again, you often, when you first think of an eating disorder, most people have this picture or image in their head of someone perhaps with anorexia nervosa, um, someone who um, by definition, based on the DSM, would be someone that is of a very low weight. And that's a very visible thing. We can look at someone and say, wow, she's very underweight. I'm, I'm wondering if she has an eating disorder. However, it's not such the case with someone with bulimia or binge eating disorder. Often individuals with bulimia are of normal weight. That's part of the criteria is that they are near normal weight. Um, and that those with binge eating disorder, um, it's really hard to tell if it's someone with binge eating disorder or if it's someone who is overweight for, uh, for other reasons, not necessarily related to um, an emotional disorder. Um, so we're, we see quite a bit of variability within our treatment setting, although you wouldn't necessarily know that um, if, you weren't, if you weren't here every day. Other things that we're certainly seeing compared to, say, the beginnings of Renfrew in 1985 is certainly a significant increase in complexity and comorbidity. Um, so back in the day, 19, between 1985 and the mid and early 90s, um, you would frequently see um, individuals come into treatment with a diagnosis of anorexia or bulimia, and that would really be about it. Um, and so we had a pretty clear direction of how we wanted to treat this client and were very effective and successful in doing so. Um, those clients do not come to seek treatment anymore. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't exist, but they're not being treated at the higher levels of care that we, that we provide. We're in an acute residential setting. So um, for many factors related to um, insurance and other, other, other reasons, um, individuals who, who come into residential treatment for eating disorders, it is an extremely rare circumstance where you would see someone with a diagnosis of an eating disorder without some other comorbid condition. The um, 
the areas that we see most frequently comorbid with eating disorders would certainly be substance abuse, and I don't think this will surprise anyone that's listening in on the phone. Um, and I'm sure that in your own settings, whether you be in outpatient treatment or in or an inpatient residential setting for substance abuse, um, you've probably seen um, and experienced a lot of clients that may have um, achieved sobriety um, and they're they're clean and sober and they're not they're not using drugs and alcohol and then they start to you start to notice an increase in eating disorder behaviors or that swapping, if you will. Um, I'm sure that's not a phenomenon that's any new to anyone on the phone, and it's not a not phenomenon that's new to us. And it's a problem. It's a big problem. So that's one of the things that we're looking at today is what do we do about that particular issue where someone stops using their their substance use behaviors as a method of coping and then starts using eating disorders instead. Because to me that leads us into the question of what what's what's the issue with the coping and how do we how do we help with that? Um, Certainly in our environment, we also see a high level of comorbidity with anxiety disorders and mood disorders, um, and uh, that really, um, I'm sure you're seeing that in your environment as well. So moving on to looking at complexity, looking more at kind of a snapshot of what a typical client might be um, that's that's in our midst, and and the word typical is somewhat ironic because no no <laughs> no patient is typical, um, and that's really what we're really talking about today is that none of our patients kind of fit the mold, um, that they're all incredibly complex, and that we as human beings inevitably are pretty darn complex. The way our brains work, um, the interplay between our thoughts, our um, our physical sensations, and our our overall emotional experiences, and thus how we we behave in response to them, is incredibly complex. So there are a lot of variables that you need to consider when um, when seeing a patient for the first time that's in your setting. And some of the variables that we certainly consider, obviously, are the psychological, as I mentioned earlier, any comorbidity, um, say with substance abuse, trauma, um, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, um, that obviously a very thorough psychosocial evaluation, biopsychosocial evaluation would certainly yield that. Also need to, needing to keep in mind certainly um, issues with um, temperament or, or personality um, also can certainly add a layer of complexity to an individual patient when you're taking, taking a step back and looking at the big picture. Um, in our particular setting, certainly medical and nutritional um, concerns are, are, are definitely a high priority. Um, eating disorders more so than any other um, mental health disorder or psychiatric disorder um, have a high rate of medical complications and unfortunately a high rate of mortality um, due to the medical complications that can come as a result of engaging in eating disorder behavior. So, um, you know, and it really ranges from anything of, you know, osteo porosis at an early age due to, you know, malnutrition and vitamin deficiencies to women with advanced renal failure, um, cardiac arrest in otherwise healthy looking women. Um, and I just, you couldn't see me, but I said that with air quotes, healthy looking um, women. And um, the, the medical consequences are vast and are serious, which is why specialized care and um, high-level acute care is really essential for individuals with eating disorder because sometimes the risks are invisible. Um, another example of that might be um, abnormal um, labs. So most patients, when they look and appear healthier and of at normal weight, you wouldn't often take someone's labs regularly and standardly. But um, changes in sodium, um, changes in potassium, these are critical um, and could be life life endangering, and so unfortunately, there are more stories than I can count of young women who, again, otherwise looked normal, um, that that have have not survived um, their eating disorder due to kind of acute acute medical concerns related to that. So those are important variables, certainly, to to pay attention to and to prioritize. Um, and that other psychosocial stressors are also coming into play, especially when you're looking at not only treatment planning in the most immediate acute care residential setting, but certainly planning for discharge and aftercare and relapse prevention, that we have to take a look at the whole picture and um, really tailor our treatment in order to um, meet the needs of the individual, which, again, when the individual is incredibly complex is not an easy thing to do. Um, other things to kind of think about is that a lot of our, our individuals with eating disorders, and again, the, the folks that you guys are seeing out in the world, um, 
experienced some frequent hospitalizations. And for us, that could be either, you know, acute psychiatric hospitalization due to um, self-injury or um, suicidal tendencies or something like that, um, to also frequent medical hospitalizations related to the things I mentioned before, electrolyte imbalances, dehydration, um, you know, renal failure, any any other number of things. So um, that is not an uncommon thing, which certainly um, can can get in the way of doing uh, good psychotherapeutic treatment when a patient is so medically unstable. Um, certainly, we we know and see that the more complex the patient tends to be, with the more variables we have to kind of take into account. Often, the slower the pace is of treatment. Um, if a patient's coming in. Um, acutely ill and severely malnourished, their ability to kind of do treatment um, in the way that we would like them to do is is usually pretty minimal, and that it often takes quite a long time and that we have to be um, patient and wait for their, their bodies to respond to some of the medical and nutritional interventions that are put in place before they're actually able to kind of fully engage in treatment in a meaningful way. Um, certainly, patients that are, that are complex in all of these different ways um, take take something special <laughs> from the therapist or require a different level of energy um, and um, care and concern from a, from a therapist than perhaps a patient that maybe it's a little bit more clear cut as far as what sorts of interventions need to take place in order to help them move forward in their recovery. Um, and certainly even thinking about kind of the, the, the impact on the therapist, you know, certainly the impact on, you know, treating patients that have been, that have come to you and have received that label that they're, they're chronic. Um, I don't know how often that's something that you hear or see, but I know that's something we see a lot. And it, it can be disheartening when you have someone kind of walk through the door and sit in your chair for the first time and um, they carry that, that ominous label that they are chronic, thus implying that the prognosis is poor, implying that um, perhaps no matter what you do, um, you know, don't don't go ahead and expect there to be a change. I tend to be more of an optimist than that. Um, I believe that full recovery is possible. Um, our philosophy here at Renfrew is that recovery is possible, but that certainly it, it certainly can feel daunting at times, um, depending on the presentation of the patient and the number of treatment episodes they've had. Um, it's not an uncommon thing for people to have had 10, 15, 20 treatment episodes before coming into treatment and acute residential care. Um, patient and family expectations certainly come into play, and often their expectations may not be in line with that of the patient or certainly that of the treatment team, so that is yet another complicating factor. And obviously, ambivalence or low motivation. You know, we, we all recognize that ambivalence is a natural part of kind of the process, that there are going to be lots of reasons for someone to want to change and just as many, if not more, reasons for them to want to stay the same because change is very difficult. Recovery is hard work and difficult and means that they have to do things differently and face things that they've been really trying to avoid for a very long time. Um, so, again, recognizing that this is yet another layer of complication that makes it harder for us as clinicians to provide the most effective treatment um, in a way that is, is feasible um, within the, the context of a short-term residential treatment stay, or certainly a longer-term step-down stay through lower levels of care. And we've already mentioned personality disturbances as well, but that yet another thing to think about. So another way to kind of look at it, this slide actually was one that I made a long time ago when I was looking to do just a little like um, case conceptualization or uh, case study on one particular patient. So you look at it, you notice all these different kind of bubbles and shapes and um, this is all actually very explicitly talking about one particular patient and that this is becoming the norm. So the, the title of the, the um, presentation is, is diagnostic complexity becoming the norm? Well, the short answer is yes. Yes, it is. Um, so it's not uncommon to see all of the cluster of these things that we're seeing. So um, this particular person, which, what she looked like when she came into the door was a woman in her late 20s um, who not only had a severe eating disorder, anorexia nervosa with binge purge type, meaning she restricted her, her caloric intake and restricted certain food groups to a very low number of calories per day, but that she also binged and purged um, very frequently, um, ritualistically, many, many times a day, 20 to 30 or more times a day, um, that not only was that something we were contending with and that that was so severe that she was so medically compromised that she was no longer ambulatory. She was in a wheelchair. And not only was she in a wheelchair, she was in a wheelchair with a seatbelt. 
because if you can't hold your body up, if you don't have enough nourishment in your body to actually hold yourself upright, um, that that certainly is a big indicator that um, you're at a critical state medically. And imagine if that were the case, how this person would be impacted cognitively if the malnourishment was so severe, how capable this person was to be able to, again, engage in psychotherapy. Um, a pretty big challenge. So not only that, she had a long, long history of sexual abuse, um, had also been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, had engaged in quite a bit of substance abuse and had a diagnosis of not only alcohol dependence, but also um, benzodiazepine dependence that was in, in full remission in a controlled environment, which we were the controlled environment and she was in a previous a treatment center immediately before us. But that you know, without the constraints and external structures um, of treatment may not have been the case. Um, PTSD was binging and purging, had um, a very, um, very enmeshed relationship with the parents, was self-harming frequently, was unemployable, had never been able to hold a job more than a few days, and it had a history of numerous suicide attempts. So when I was Years ago, when I was a, a newer, less experienced clinician, and I, I met this woman, um, it was incredibly overwhelming to me, and I thought that this was the exception. I thought that this type of patient was super special um, patient and that this was the exception, but that um, the more experience I have and the more experience we have here, um, this, this is becoming, again, um, much more typical of what we might see coming into treatment at this high level of care. Um, this is just a little bit of data to give you, looking if you're looking at incidence rates and comorbidity um, amongst the eating disorders. So we have it separated out as anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, and sub-threshold binge eating disorder, meaning they do kind of hold all the trademarks of an individual that binge eats that does not purge, but they may not um, meet the criteria as far as the frequency in which they purge within a given week or something. So sub-threshold. Um, and what I noticed in red at least, um, because I thought this would be most relevant to, to the folks on the phone, would be certainly a high, high rate of, of co-occurrence with um, problems with impulse control and certainly substance use. And you'll notice that there's a marked difference at least between individuals with bulimia and um, sub-threshold binge eating disorder compared to, say, anorexia or even more traditional binge eating disorder. There's a couple of hypotheses as to this, but typically um, the way we would postulate is that individuals with um, bulimia tend to have a temperament um, and personality traits that tend to be a little bit more impulsive, a little bit more um, sensation-seeking, novelty-seeking, which, um, again, certainly correlates with individuals with substance use and impulse control problems. So um, it makes sense that we would see a higher incidence in those with bulimia than those with anorexia. But again, the numbers are compelling enough that it's important for us as professionals from different kind of spectrums to come together and look at the problem. So another layer to this problem is that we as clinicians um, tend to have a hard time um, bridging the gap between what's found in the research, okay, so what is academia finding, what's happening in the laboratories, what, is, what compelling clinical evidence are they having, are, is, is coming out of academia, and how do we actually as a clinician out I myself in Coconut Creek, Florida, what do I do with that information? You know, it's in a journal out there. I could read it. And I might understand it, I might not. And then what do I do with that information? So um, it, it's, really, it's really a problem that goes in both directions as well because those of us who are not necessarily in the acad academia world and in the research world um, absolutely have a wealth of information to offer because we're in the trenches every day. We're seeing clients every day. Um, and we don't always talk to one another. So the researchers and the, and the clinicians historically, unfortunately, don't talk to one another quite so well. And because we have these differing viewpoints, um, it really has been a barrier to really taking the best of what we know as clinicians and the best of what they know as researchers and academics and really fusing them together, integrating them together to provide the most optimal care for patients. Um, so um, another thing to kind of consider is that we, we also bring our emotion, own emotion into that. So researchers are feeling devalued when we as clinicians are not paying attention to what they're doing and they're spending, you know, decades and decades collecting data and working very hard and tirelessly because they are passionate about treating people with eating disorders and we are passionate about 
treating eating disorders, but we also don't want to be told how to do it by people who are off in a, in a laboratory or working for a university. So um, we, I think it would be useful for us both to be mindful of the other's perspective, certainly, um, and consider kind of bridging that gap. So some other things that certainly perpetuate that gap and there's another layer to this problem of what do we do with this complex patient if we as clinicians have some distinct ideas about how treatment should happen based on our anecdotal experience and then researchers have a different set of ideas about what we're supposed to do based on the data they're collecting and the research they're conducting Um, because essentially our values are different, our perspectives are different. We as clinicians are concerned with relationships, we're concerned with the art of doing therapy, um, with, with clinical intuition and the nuance of of, um, interacting and engaging with another human being. We learn from doing, and we base what we know and what we do on what we've been doing for years and years, whereas the researchers, you know, want the numbers. They want it to be measurable, and they want to take the information and use the science to inform what we do. And again, it behooves us as non-researchers, as clinicians, to to pay attention to that. because they have so much to offer. So um, what I'm suggesting as we we move forward is that we we begin to start to take a look at what what we can do to bridge that gap. So other factors that just make this even harder is that researchers and clinicians don't tend to speak the same language. Interpersonally, we're kind of different styles of people, um, and certainly we have a different set of language. So again, you, I read a scholarly journal article. I do, I took a research class way back in the day. I know what it's saying, kind of, um, but I don't always know what this actually means and how to apply it to practice. And then certainly when you have all of these research protocols that come out that say this is what you need to do, um, for your patients, it doesn't always have real world, real world applicability. These are things that are very costly, very time consuming, um, and may just not fit into the environment that, of the treatment setting that I work in. So this certainly um, is yet another barrier to kind of bridging that gap. So we have another question that I'd like to ask that I think will be helpful for me as well and hopefully um, yield some interesting results is I'd like you to let us know what theoretical approach um, most closely fits the way you practice. I couldn't add an infinite number here of options. So your options would be CBT, um, the 12-step or traditional model, uh, motivational interviewing, psychodynamic, person-centered, or eclectic. So go ahead on your on your screen or your smartphone and select that answer. Um, and this, I think, would be interesting. And again, I have a theory. I have a hypothesis about what is going to be the biggest one, but but maybe I'm wrong, which that's okay. Prove me wrong. Let's check it out. Ah, well, I was somewhat wrong. Let's see. So CBT is actually winning winning the win in the race here, which is not surprising in that most clinicians who've been trained in the past 15 years or so, um, you know, there isn't a graduate school out there that isn't going to be pretty highly focused on CBT. Um, But what my hypothesis was, was that I was going to find eclectic to be the winner, but it's in second place. So that's, that's, that's useful and notable. And that I think what we find a lot of times is that people are practicing eclectically or integratively would be another way to say it, is that we as clinicians over time have recognized that our patients are incredibly complex. Therefore, no one specific theoretical model always fits every single person. Um, So it's important for us to kind of keep that in mind as we move forward. And when you look ahead at this next particular slide, it looks similar to that slide I showed you earlier. Um, But what this is, is just a um, representation of how complex (laughs) the range of options we have available to us to treat our complex clients. Now, on the one hand, that's great that we have. There's such a wealth of information and knowledge base out there that is highly specialized that provides us with some really great, useful tools to use with patients. However, how's a girl to know, and by a girl I mean me, how am I supposed to know when I'm developing a treatment plan for a patient that has more than one diagnosis, more than one problem, how am I supposed to know which of these to use or in which combination? Because if we had that client that I showed you earlier on that very similar slide that had the very severe eating disorder, substance abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar Um, any number of other things. Um, If you look at that, there's a distinct um, gold standard for each one of those problems. So how do I know? 
And what I feel like is that I'm just throwing darts at a dartboard half the time, and I'm hoping that something sticks. I'll do a little CBT over here for these thoughts that are pretty unhelpful, and then I'm going to do a little DBT over here because she's self-harming. Oh, and she's struggling with drinking, so I think I'm going to kind of incorporate some some MI and recommend that she goes to some 12-step meetings on the side. Like, we just kind of, like, pick because it's the best that we have to offer. And I guess what I'm not saying is that's not wrong, um, but that's also a very difficult way. Way, um, to to do things, and it doesn't always provide us with um, a level of, of certainty around whether or not we're we're making the best choices for our patient. Now, um, when looking at this research practice gap problem, there's there's a guy out there named David Barlow. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a big deal in my life. Um, I, I, he's done a lot of work on the research practice gap, and he's been doing clinical research. This is his sixth decade of clinical research. So um, he is highly prolific um, and highly inf- influential, particularly in the CBT field. And he was studying this problem of this research practice gap. And what he realized was that these research treatments, these manualized treatments, just really weren't being used in practice. And there's actually an institute, like National Institute of Health Survey, um, that came out that it shows there's a range between 12 and 17 years it takes for a research-based treatment to actually make it into into the therapy room. That's a huge gap. And he recognized this to be a problem because we have all of these manuals for single disorders. So there could be a lot of you mentioned that your CBT tends to be your orientation. So if you if you're a CBT therapist, you'll know there's a CBT manual for anxiety more generalized. There's a CBT manual for phobias, a CBT manual for OCD. Um, So even within the realm of anxiety disorders, there's several different manuals that have differing interventions. Um, And it's not always clear which one to use because most of our patients do not just want to have have one problem and the the treatments can be hard to combine, combine and sometimes inconsistent. So the solution that Dr. Barlow suggests is that we really need to focus on principles um, because all of the different theoretical orientations that I mentioned earlier, CBT, DBT, ACT, MI, um, you name it, really offer us some, some great wisdom. And there's a lot of differences in the way that their treatment interventions are carried out, but there's a lot of similarities and overarching shared um, principles, and that really we're looking at treating the same shared underlying problems that drive emotional disorders. And if we look to really open up our conceptualization to looking at the person as a whole and looking at their cluster of symptoms as an emotional disorder, meaning that their symptoms are serving a function emotionally, then that does allow us to look at our patient a little bit differently and um, address the, those problems in treatment a little bit differently. So this may or may not be a familiar term for you. Um, up until about two years ago, it was not super familiar to me, um, is the Unified Protocol or the UP. So Dr. Barlow developed a unified protocol after many, many years, again, of clinical research in which this particular theoretical model, and it is a theoretical model, a totally legit one, um, that really distills and incorporates the key principles of evidence-based CBT. So the things that we know are tried and tested, um, and it really looks at addressing core underlying mechanisms of common emotional disorders. Because all those disorders I was mentioning earlier, I was mentioning some of the subtypes of eating disorders. We're talking about substance abuse, trauma, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, they all have some very important key characteristics that are shared, and that means that our emotions certainly function um, in a way to serve our behavior. And so um, what this this solution offers, a unified protocol offers, is an alternative method to having the darts, throwing the darts at the dartboard. It offers a more integrated um, solution. So one way to look at this is that it's a transdiagnostic approach. So that means we're crossing over the diagnoses, which is actually moving in line with the way that the DSM-5 is organized. And I realize I just see my error on the slide that the five should be the numeral five and not the Roman numeral. So for those people who are picky like me, forgive me. Um, but that really what we're doing here is we're targeting the core mechanism, not so much the specific disorders or symptoms. So if I could So just to like sum it up at this point, it doesn't matter whether someone's restricting their intake, binging, purging, drinking, using drugs, cutting, or any of those other stuff that we tend to see, and we tend to see all of that stuff sometimes. It doesn't matter whether someone's using symptom A or symptom C. (laughs) What matters is why are they doing it? 
what is that that behavior functioning as? What is the core mechanism? And if we look at it that way, we have a much more clear direction as to what we're doing in our treatment. So this allows us to have a unifying case conceptualization so that instead of looking at that picture that I showed you with all of those squares and circles and triangles and then trying to make a treatment plan from that, which inevitably would be many, many pages long with many um, you know, presenting problem areas and then underlining um, interventions with short-term goals and long-term goals. This really allows us to kind of consolidate and, again, much more effectively look at this person as a whole, as a big picture, without getting stuck in the minutia and the details, because I know I personally struggle with that and really get stuck on some of that stuff. Um, so it's working with one set of therapeutic principles that's comprehensive and effective. And, and by effective, I mean this is an evidence-based treatment. It's been researched for over a decade now and is shown to be efficacious and does actually meet the standards that are set forth to say that they are an EBT or evidence-based treatment. And one of the beauties of it is that it, because this has this unifying case conceptualization, it is designed to treat comorbidity um, and not just one particular disorder. And then ultimately, this is much more trained efficient in training for clinicians. So if I'm a clinician that treats a wide variety of problems, because again, each individual person that comes to see us often has a wide variety of problems, I could fill my bookshelf with manuals, CBT manuals, DBT manuals on for all of these different things. Um, but I'm not going to really be an expert at any one of those um, because we, we can't. We can't be an expert at everything. So this allows a much more efficient method um, for not only treating, but certainly um, being trained to treat in a very competent and effective way. And certainly is easier for patients to understand as well. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why. So our main premise of treatment is that people with emotional disorders, which again, here's the clue, all of those disorders I mentioned earlier would be classified as emotional disorders. They experience negative affect more intensely and more inf more frequently than, say, someone who does not have a disordered emotions. They often experience their emotions as being intolerable and want unwanted. So I'm experiencing something. I don't like it. I don't want it. Just make it go away. And the way that they make it go away is they use often very unhelpful or maladaptive emotion regulation strategies um, in an effort to either avoid that emotion completely or dampen it down and make it less uncomfortable. And those strategies tend to be those symptoms we talk about, the binging, the purging, the restricting, the cutting, the drinking, the drugs. Um, which is why it's important. So as I said before, diverse symptoms function similarly. It doesn't matter what the symptom is. The most important thing that we're looking at is the conceptualization that this is an emotion that's disordered. It's a problem of emotion regulation. And that, that problem is that we often tend to do use our symptoms to control, avoid, or suppress the way that we are feeling. Um, there's a few types of avoidance strategies that are listed, but I'm being mindful of the time and we won't go into those in great detail. But that ultimately a really important thing to think about is that our symptoms are very much negatively reinforced by the positive feeling that comes away, comes from taking the negative feeling away. So that, that kind of textbook definition of negative reinforcement. So for um, using alcohol, for example, um, if in the moment I can feel better and more numb by drinking alcohol or using a benzo or an opiate or purging um, or cutting, then that is so powerfully reinforcing. It doesn't really matter to me in the long term that these are things that totally ruin my life. And that's the problem. That's why we have an uphill battle as clinicians. So how would eating, why would eating disorders and substance abuse fall into that category if it wasn't already obvious? Is that these sorts of symptoms that we experience that treatment providers see of our patients um, absolutely fall into that category as a behavioral attempt to influence, change, or control patient, painful emotional states. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, it provides that short-term, very short-term relief from an aversive emotional experience. But the big problem is that in the long term, the consequences are much more problematic. So the core components of the treatment of the unified protocol, which I won't be able to go into in great detail today, would be helping patients understand the function of their emotions um, and that our emotions are adaptive and useful, emotional awareness and acceptance, the fact that we can have some ability to change our thoughts or at least change the patterns of behavior we have in response to our thoughts, ultimately changing behavior in which that's one of the things that we certainly need to see. Um, we need to see behavioral change. 
So a few thoughts on the function of emotion, and I have this cute little picture up top from the movie Inside Out, just doing a little plug if anyone has seen it. Um, this movie has really good science behind it. This movie is the concept of function of emotions in a nutshell, and basically what that means is that um, all emotions, even the ones that we tend to think of as bad emotions, um, actually have a very adaptive and useful function. It's signaling us something. It's telling us that, hey, person, you need to respond. Something's going on. The problem is that we often don't, um, when we have disordered emotions, we don't often respond in a way that's more helpful. We respond in a way that's emotionally driven and less than helpful or maladaptive. Um, one particular way um, the model uses to help patients better understand their own emotional experience or become their own emotional expert is to break down their emotional experience into three component parts. Um, I think this is essential and again, not, not far from traditional CBT, um, but takes an added layer of really looking and honing in on physiological sensations. And for individuals with eating disorder, physiological sensations um, are often um, highly, they are highly aversive to physiological sensations, highly reactive to physiological sensations, and react in ways, again, that are less than helpful. So taking each emotional experience, so if you could look at the emotion, say, of anxiety, of someone experiencing anxiety, um, when someone's feeling anxious, they have certain physiological sensations, they have certain thoughts that they're associated with that, and then certain behaviors or urges. Um, essentially to do things to make that anxiety go away. So this really illustrates that point. And then ultimately what we're wanting to do is help patients be more accepting their rare emotions. So we're not wanting to change the emotional experience. We're wanting it to exist. We're wanting us to have it, to, for it to provide us with information, but then not let it um, influence the way that we act in a way that's less than helpful. Um, and one way of doing that is through mindfulness exercises um, and the way we would refer to that in the UP as a non-judgmental present focused awareness because if you're focused in the moment to what's happening in the moment in context, um, oftentimes that provides us with more um, perspective and opportunity to make decisions that are more, more helpful versus less than helpful. When looking at cognitions, one thing that kind of sets um, the UP apart a little bit from traditional CBT is that we're not necessarily um, insisting upon our patients changing their thoughts because we realize that's not always an easy thing to do. I really don't, I personally kind of stink at this because I can, I can counter a thought all day long. I can tell you what the opposite is, but that doesn't mean I'm going to believe it and that it's going to influence my behavior. So what we're really focusing here is on reappraisal and acknowledging that our thoughts are are subjective. They're not the only thing that is true. That oftentimes we have one particular way that we tend to think about things, our, our automatic appraisal, and that that way tends to be pretty harsh, judgmental, and critical. So we're at looking for cognitive flexibility more than we are on just abruptly changing because we recognize that to be a more attainable goal. Um, this particular little cartoon I think is useful as we've talked about avoidance a little bit, but um, what it illustrates is if you imagine um, yourself as the guy in the, I guess it's a guy, in the little car, and you're moving towards that cloud, and that cloud represents an emotional experience that's really uncomfortable and very distressing, and that as you move towards him, he gets bigger and scarier. So you have, you have two decisions. You can move towards him and pass him through that barricade to that little shiny hilltop, and that hilltop represents your values and the things that are important to you. Or if you're engaging in avoidance, which most of us most of the time would default to this, we would take that curve in the road and go off towards those, that dark mountaintop. Now, in the short term, this feels like a good decision because in the short term, at least we don't have to face that scary emotional experience, that distressing emotional experience. But the problem is that in the long term, we're off somewhere else and we're, we're getting further and further away from our values and the things that are important. So uh, avoidance would be any cognitive or behavioral strategy that's meant to to minimize or or completely eliminate feeling something that you don't want to feel. And again, I think we all do this and that we can look at most any um, symptom that we see someone presenting with in treatment, presenting problem as oftentimes being a method of of avoidance, of emotional or experiential avoidance or behavioral avoidance. Oops, I skipped back too fast. Um, and that emotion-driven behaviors would be then the opposite end of the time frame, meaning we get engage in avoidance behaviors to not feel anxious, angry, sad. Um, and then when we can't avoid those things, when we go ahead and feel them anyway, 
oftentimes we might have a very strong and aversive reaction to that and engage in emotion-driven behaviors or EDBs. And one important point about this that I tend to stick on with the clients that I work with is that um, emotion-driven behavior, I think, is actually a much more clear way to define what's happening for them. So it's one thing to call... um, your behavior a symptom. It's another thing to call it an emotion-driven behavior because it's much, again, more explicit because symptom could could, um, have a different connotation of being something that may or may not be within your control. But an emotion-driven behavior is in your control. You're choosing to let the emotion take take the lead, which is, again, not always the most helpful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and quickly get past some of these avoidance strategies. Um, One example that I think is notable, though, would be perhaps an overuse of a a PRN benzo to dampen down anxiety associated with feared situations. So in our environment, we are not a primarily substance abuse environment. There are patients that do legitimately get a prescription for benzos. Um, You may or may not agree with that. Um, But what I can tell you is that um, that would be something that we would list as an avoidance strategy that to be avoided. Now, moving on, I just want to get us kind of through these avoidance strategies, um, and I wish we had more time, but I tend to talk a lot, and I acknowledge that. The last kind of piece I want us to think about is that with changing behavior, the only way to do that is to really engage in some exposure-based um, activities, and that our clients are naturalistically exposed to things all the time. So, for example, eating disorder clients, the day that, first day they walk in here, we do expect them to eat food. That's a naturalistic exposure, but that we also have a very coordinated set of exposure experiences that are um, influenced by exposure and response prevention therapy, which is yet another evidence-based treatment that is now part of the unified protocol um, that has a high, high level of of effectiveness um, with changing behavior, and and that would be a wide range of behaviors, not just eating disorders, not just an anxiety response. So just to wrap it up, we're looking at this unifying principle of treatment. We see patients coming into treatment, patients with eating disorders, substance abuse, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, that they are intolerant of their emotional experiences, they're highly avoidant of experiencing their emotions, and they're engaging in a wide range of symptoms or emotion-driven behaviors, and that this treatment, this a transdiagnostic treatment, allows them to, to really develop some emotional competence, um, accept the fact that their emotions are useful and adaptive, accept that they often can be uncomfortable, but that they provide us useful information, allow them to regulate their emotions so that there's not such extreme ups and downs, and then ultimately being more flexible in the way they behaviorally respond to the emotional experiences they have. And that our, you know, our ultimate goals with this approach, this transdiagnostic treatment approach, is to reduce the intensity uh, and the frequency of maladaptive emotional experiences, to improve their competence, um, and to be their own emotional expert, and to ultimately build motivation and show them that they can do this and that they only will be able to by practice and repetition and ultimately create measurable and sustainable change. Because if we've addressed the core underlying mechanism as to why their emotions are not functioning so well and their behaviors are not functioning, so well, we actually have a chance and not experiencing those problems we had before where they're swapping symptoms. They're becoming sober, but then, you know, engaging in eating disorder behavior. So they get their eating disorder under control and then start drinking out of control. Um, So to finish it up, I have one last little poll question is based on the things we talked about today, um, would you consider learning more about and using um, a more transdiagnostic conceptualization or practice? or approach in your practice moving forward. So go ahead and click on that, yes, no, or still not sure. I only talked about it for less than an hour, so I don't expect you to be sure. But if you read more about it, I think you probably will. Ah, that is what I wanted to see. So thank you to all of you that are on because you just made my day. I might screenshot this and save it for later because that, 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 that helped me <laughs> move forward. So on that, I will stop talking. Ah. Well, thank you, Melanie, for a great presentation, and I'm so pleased that we ended on such an up note. That was fabulous. Uh, Before we get to the Q&A portion of today's event, I'd like to hand things over to Melanie Melcher from Foundations for a few words from our sponsor. Melanie? Thanks, Julie. Here at Foundations Recovery Network, our grassroots movement called Heroes in Recovery has a simple mission, to eliminate the social stigma that keeps addicted individuals from seeking help to share stories of recovery for the purpose of encouragement and inspiration and to create an engaged, sober community that empowers people 
to get involved, give back, and live healthy, active lives. Join us in this mission at our 6K race series at these locations across the country. As a thank you for your attendance today, please enjoy the discount code WEBINAR2015 to register for any future 6K event. Back to you, Julie. Great. Thank you so much. We have had a number of questions come in, but you can use that Q&A widget below the slides to submit your question. So, Melanie Smith, let's dig in. Uh, a substance abuse counselor in the audience is asking, how can I adequately assess if or when a client's focus on physical exercise or rigid calorie intake moves from a renewed interest in being healthy mm -hmm. to an obsession? Yeah, well, I, I know. And I mean, I think there's such a fine line. And because, um, you know, diet and, dieting and exercise are very pro-social, socially accepted and, um, you know, applauded behaviors, it's really tricky um, sometimes. What I would say is that especially like um, something that's pretty cut and dry for me, say, with exercise, if someone can't um, take a day off, if, say, it's raining outside and they're a runner and they still need to find a way to, like, rain and run and pace their house without the treadmill because they can't tolerate not running, that would be an indicator that there is some sort of um, extreme um, extreme thoughts and certainly connection to that to that behavior. Um, another example with food would be if you're, you know, in a substance abuse setting and your dining room offers whatever food it offers and this particular individual is very limited in the type of food that they're willing and able to eat and say this is the only thing that's available and, um, and they would just not eat because they can't eat it and they have an extreme amount of, they're showing an extreme amount of distress, anxiety, anger, or frustration around being faced with needing to eat something that they typically wouldn't eat, um, that would be an indicator. Because if I went somewhere and the only food served was not something I liked, I would probably still eat some of it if I was hungry. And I'd probably be like, oh, I wish I had something different, but I may not respond in a way that was quite so extreme as to not eat at all or make a fuss or a scene or be upset about it. So those are some pretty clear-cut, um, more clear-cut ways, I guess, to, to know. Great. Um, and someone in the audience asks, um, with the diagnostic complexity of some of these patients, how do we define what is recovery? Uh, uh, that is a, yet another awesome question. Um, you know, that's that's a great question because I think um, there's some cut and dry ways to do it. Is are they using are they using symptoms or not? Um, would be one thing, but I don't think that's enough. I don't think that actually tells the full the full story because someone can be um, remittent from symptoms and not engaging actively in symptoms, but then um, still having a high level of dysregulation that in causes them to engage in other behaviors. So I think um, symptom remission tells one piece of the story. For me, the bigger piece, which is harder to assess, would be kind of just flexibility um, with, their, with their openness and willingness to tolerate the ups and downs of life, to tolerate that today might be a sucky day, um, and I'm upset about that, and I'm able to label that and say that this is really upsetting and distressing to me, that I'm experiencing some, some anxiety and some anger about it, that I really, you know, would love to just go do something to make me not feel this and go eat like a whole chocolate cake and drink a bottle of wine. Um, but that I also know that that's not what's best for me and that that's actually going to have much bigger consequences for me down the road, especially because it's probably not going to be just one time. So I'm going to go ahead and do something different. So it's not just remitting from the symptoms, but still acknowledging that like emotionally things are hard and that as human beings, we have difficult emotions all the time and that life tosses us stuff all the time and actively choosing to not act on our tendencies, our urges, the, those behaviors that we've kind of fallen back on so much. So I feel like it's two parts, I guess. Okay, great. And let's see if yeah. we can squeeze in one more real quick one before we wrap okay. it up. Um, we've had a few questions about uh, older adults. They often present as being thin and frail and someone in our audience asks, you know, how do we raise awareness that older wo women do have eating disorders sometimes uh, because this person believes that um, primary care is not really acknowledging it? Just a quick tip from you. Yeah. Well, I'm, I agree. I agree that that's a problem. And I think that the best thing that we can do 
is not only become educated consumers and advo- for ourselves, but really becoming advocates for doing what we can to speak up, to educate, to um, to talk to primary care providers, to talk to the physicians that are in your facilities that are doing evaluations and may not be recognizing these things. Um, we, we do some marketing around this particular um, issue as well, but I, I think um, older adults continue to be an underserved population, um, particularly in eating disorders. So um, it's, an, it's an ongoing struggle and, a, and an uphill one at that. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today, but this was a great discussion. We do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. And again, should you have any issues with this process, we ask that you don't reach out to today's sponsor. They won't be able to help you in receiving your certificate. CE Learning Systems has approved today's program for one continuing education credit. To receive your certificate of completion, you must click on the green CE certificate widget, which you see on the screen, then complete the evaluation form and click submit. For those watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the group submission guide and the program evaluation, which you will find in the resources area and follow the instructions provided. Now, for those of you watching from a mobile device or a tablet, you'll need to email the help desk to receive an evaluation form and a certificate for this program. Please note again that CE credit is not available for the archive webinar. It's only available for the live event today. If you have additional questions, please click on the Contact Webinar Help Desk button at the bottom of the screen. And I would like to thank Melanie Smith once once again for a very excellent presentation today. I'd also like to thank Millennium Health for making today's Foundation's Recovery Network program possible. And finally, thank you to everyone in our audience today for participating. We do hope that you'll join us again in the future for another Addiction Professional Webinar. This concludes today's presentation.